I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Today we're picking up with part two of this quadcopter build. You can see here what we've done so far. In part one, we installed the motors, the ESCs, and the PDB. Everything has been soldered up. If you want to watch part one, I'll put a link down in the video description, or I'll put a card in the upper right-hand corner of the video. I want to address a question that some of you asked in the comments of part one, which is, why am I soldering the signal wires to the PDB. Normally the signal wires get soldered straight to the flight controller. And the reason for that is that the Flying Lemon Kiwi, that's the flight controller I'm using, this is the Kiwi V2, uh, it has an integrated PDB. So you can see in the upper left hand corner of the PDB there are some pins and when the flight controller stacks on top those pins are going to socket into a receptacle and that'll pass through all the signal wire connections. It'll also pass through the data from the current sensor. Yep, the PDB has a current sensor on it so you get, you get current sensing which you often don't get if you're using a separate PDB. This is one of the really nice things about the Flying Lemon Kiwi. It strikes a really nice balance. It gives you all of the advantages of a flight controller like the Holy Bro Kakute AIO or the Betaflight F3. It gives you all the advantages of a flight controller with a built-in PDB, but none of the disadvantages. Uh, like if you, you know, if you damage something, well, you only have to replace a cheap PDB instead of an expensive flight controller. The disadvantage, of course, is that you have two boards instead of one, but there's no trade-offs for everything. And here's a closer look at the Flying Lemon Kiwi. Uh, it's a very nicely designed board. I really like these edge launch pads. I think they're great for direct soldering. I prefer them to through holes. I don't use the through hole part of the through hole anyway. I don't like sticking the wires through there. I just solder on top of them. And with these edge launch pads, you can have pads on the top and the bottom. However, almost all of the pads you're actually going to use are on the top side of the board. Unlike, for example, the Betaflight F3, where you have to solder the ESC uh, signal wires on the bottom of the board, and it's a real hassle to do rework. Uh, most of the stuff you can use on the Kiwi is on top of the board, so that's nice. Now I'm going to prep the wires for the Foxier Aero camera, and the first thing you're going to see me do is cut off this extraneous VBAT wire. This is for if you want to power the camera off of uh, like 12 volts, but still have the camera's OSD read uh, the actual battery voltage. Well, I'm not going to be using the camera's OSD anyway. This flight controller has Betaflight OSD, so I'm not going to use that wire. And now I've decided instead of cutting it off, I'm going to actually just use a tiny screwdriver to lift this little locking tab. I, I usually damage the locking tab in the process, but it doesn't matter because I'm not going to use it anyway. And, oh, there we go. Just pull the pin right out. I think that's a little neater than, uh, than cutting it off. And I didn't even damage the locking tab. How about that? I'm not going to show you all the soldering in this one because I showed you all the soldering in the last one, but I do want to show you a little trick that I use for soldering uh, where I set the soldering iron down and then I hold the wire and the solder in my other hands. And it's a very simple trick, but I, you, some people are just amazed. They're like, oh, I never thought of that. So in case you never thought of this, here's a great way to solder wires like this if you don't. I find helping hands to be a little bit annoying for this kind of thing. Just setting them up takes longer than doing the actual joint, and this is faster. And now I'm going to solder the camera wire header to the vid-in pad on the flight controller. Vid-in, come, video comes from the camera into the flight controller. Um, and I'm soldering it facing out, pardon my head here, I'm soldering it facing outwards. Usually I'll solder them facing in toward the center of the board so that the wire doesn't get pulled. I don't know why I decided to do it this way, but eh, whatever. And now I'm going to show you the soldering of the battery leads. People did point out that it, the way I soldered the signal wires on the PDB, I would have been better off to do the battery leads first. Uh, so be it. This is a big 12-gauge wire, and even on my Hako 888D, which is a very powerful soldering iron, it takes a minute to heat up. I am running at 850 degrees Fahrenheit here, and it just takes you know a great big 12-gauge wire a little while to heat up. You can see me sort of moving the solder around and waiting for the solder to flow and wick into the wire. Uh, and there we go. I'm going to do one more if you want to see it again. You can see on these wires I'm having to hold them to the soldering iron for a little bit of time before they get hot enough for the solder to flow. And it's just a matter of patience, just waiting for it to happen. But uh, patience can result in you overheating something and damaging it. Uh, if your soldering iron has not got a clean tip or if your temperature isn't right, then continuing to apply, patiently apply heat will just burn the thing you're trying to apply. There's not much risk of that though with a 12 gauge wire. Hard, kind of hard to overheat those. 
Now I'm going to prep the XT60, and one of the things I like to do is turn the little things sideways. You can just grip them. They're just friction fit in there, so you can just grip them and turn them sideways. And that way when I set the XT60 down, they'll, the little cups will face up to hold the solder. Um, I'm going to also grip this with my needle driver. This is not a hemostat. It's a needle driver, I'm told. I'm going to just uh, clip it in there, and that'll hold it in place while I solder on it. Next, I like to build up a pool of solder in the connectors, and this is a little bit of a more advanced move, is I'm just barely applying heat to the very outside edge of the pin so that the solder doesn't flow down in so inside the pin. The solder will flow where the heat is. And in fact, if I start to get a little ball of molten solder, I'll actually remove the soldering iron from the pin, intentionally creating a cold joint to let the solder build up on itself rather than flowing down inside. Now I'm going to solder the wire. This is much easier to do with 14 gauge wires. 12 gauge is just a little big for an XT60, but I'll get it done. Uh, I'm still not convinced whether there's a much advantage to going to 12 gauge over 14 gauge, frankly. I've snipped the end of the 12 gauge wire off to make it short so that the insulation runs right up against the joint and just apply heat. Now do you see how it moved there while it was still molten? That's not good and that shouldn't happen. And that's why I hit it with heat again to reflow the joint. If, this, if the joint moves at all while the solder is molten, it's bad. See that big blob on the bottom there? That's also bad. I had a little too much solder on the wire maybe or the ball was too big. I'm just going to clean it up here. If you had solder wick, this would be a perfect application for solder wick. I'm going to use a solder sucker. Boop. Oh, well, <laughs> there it went. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it sucked the solder right off of there. Now I'm going to show you this negative wire joint even though it was a real mess and did not go well. So I'm human too. And I'll see, show you the good example and the bad. What happens is that I push a little too hard before the joint has uh, fully flowed. Oh, not yet. And it actually gets all, see, that's not a good joint. There's not good contact there. There's all kinds of voids and air spaces, and it's, it's not good. Cannot leave that as it is. We want to see one good solid piece of metal. So now I'm f trying to heat it and flow it, and I'm pushing on it, and it squashes out like that. That's ugly. I should not leave that as it is. And do you think I went back and fixed it? Hmm, you'll never know. And now we're going to solder to the PDB. And again, if the joint is properly prepared, it should be a piece of cake. If the joint is prepared properly and the soldering iron is clean and working properly, this part should go very smoothly. Anytime that this doesn't go smoothly, it is probably you failed to prep or your soldering iron is not working right. The technique itself is not complicated. You can't see the technique because I'm covering it up with my hands. So well, uh, the technique itself is is the, the least important part of soldering. It's the prep and having a good clean iron and everything like that is the most important part. One of the things you'd be tempted to do is push real hard to try and squish the joint down uh, before it's actually flowed, and that will spread the wire out, as you saw with the XT60. Just touch the joint and wait for the solder to flow and let the heat move, and, and once the whole joint is nice and molten, then you press it together and, and let it cool without moving it. And there you go. Not the best joint I've ever done, but acceptable. I think those joints are a little bit fat. They have a little too much solder in them, and that's because I was working with the 12 gauge wire, and the pad isn't quite big enough for that. Now I'm going to install a zip tie. The frame has a slot for a zip tie here to retain the main battery discharge lead. I always want to retain my main battery discharge lead. In case the battery ejects in a crash, I don't want it pulling on the PDB and ripping the pads off. So I always try to find a way to have some stress relief, some strain relief there. And it's the, every frame should really include something like this. Now you can see here I've included some rubber bumpers uh, for vibration isolation, which is maybe not the best idea because this board does have pins going to the PDB underneath. Some people have suggested, well, that the vibration isolation is going to be compromised. And other people have said that it can actually cause, the, the vibration can cause the pin headers to wear out and lose contact. So this may not be the best idea, but that's what I went with. And we'll see if it was a good or a bad idea as time goes on. This is an X4R SB receiver. Uh, this is the naked version. It's ordered without pins, so you don't have to deep pin it. And the big disadvantage of this receiver, well, it's a little bigger than it could be, and also it costs like 
30 bucks, which is a lot to pay for a receiver. There are very good receivers out there available in the 15 to 20 dollar range. The one that comes to mind is the XM Plus receiver. It's about 16 bucks. It's much smaller and the only real disadvantage is that it does not have telemetry. And I've talked in the first video about why I like telemetry so freaking much. However, there are a couple other receivers out there that well, like I know Furious makes an S-Bus micro receiver with telemetry. Um, TBS has one and FreeSky is actually coming out with one that I posted about on my Facebook page, uh, which is, it looks like it may just be the Holy Grail. It's 20 bucks. It's a micro receiver. It has IPEX connectors for the antennas and it does telemetry. And so I suspect I will stop using the X4R SB soon um, and replace it with that new FreeSky. What is it? I think it's the XSRM or the XSR. Yeah, I think it's the XSRM. But for now, this is the one I'm using. One of the things people ask is, why don't you stick the wires through the through holes? And I don't know, I just find this works fine. This works fine for me, and it's easier for me to solder than trying to get them through the through holes. It's also way easier for rework. If I have to redo the joint, it's easier to get it out rather than getting it off the hole. The other thing I'll point out is that I'm soldering the wires facing back towards the board, and later I'm gonna put tape around this to sort of hold them in place uh, so that they don't get pulled on, and that sort of certainly reinforces the joint. And we'll go ahead and solder this up. Uh, at this point, it's kind of just more soldering, and the real mystery is knowing where the wires should go. And of course, that's different for every flight controller, but I do have a video series, How to Wire Flight Controller Wiring for Beginners, which teaches you how to know where to put the wires. Like, so that's the signal wire, and it goes on the S-Bus pad, right? Uh, and how did I know that? Well, go ahead and check out that playlist. I'll put a link in the upper right-hand corner uh, in the cards. Uh, and you can go ahead and check that out if you want to. Now I'm going to prep the video transmitter. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off the wires. I'm not going to use like the 5 volt output for the camera. Don't need that. Uh, I'm not pulling the pins out of this one like I did on the camera. And the reason is that I just find it really hard to pull the pins out of this JST GX or what GH connector on the TBS Unify. So I just snip them off. But basically I need the audio wire. I need the video wire and I need the power. And it has two ground wires one to go to the camera and one to come from the PDB. So I'll cut off the second ground wire as well, just keeping the wires that I'm actually gonna use. So here I did a bunch of soldering and got my head in the camera a bunch. So, <laughs> but you've seen me solder, you know how to solder. Here I have, uh, I've wired the smart audio wire, the audio wire for the video transmitter to UART3. And I've wired the power, ground and video to, uh, to the appropriate place on the flight controller. And frankly, I left this lead a little bit short. I could have left myself a little more slack here and I'm going to regret it when it comes time to work on the uh, on the flight controller and on the copter but hey that's that's the mistakes you make. You can always take up slack by twisting the wire. You can never get more back except by rebuilding it so bummer. Now at this point the build is more or less complete. This is the part where I will power everything up for the first time after checking for continuity and while using a smoke stopper. And I will do things like bind the receiver. Uh, for the TBS Unify, I will input the special button press that takes it out of the lockdown mode and lets you access the full 800 milliwatt transmit power. I will test the camera. I will set up the OSD on the camera. For example, if I need to adjust the brightness, exposure, I'll do all of that stuff that's gonna be a pain in the butt to do once everything is buttoned up inside the copter. This is the time to find any errors you've made, any mistakes, before you can do all the extra work of buttoning it up and making it look neat. Now, the exact way this all goes together is often a little bit of trial and error. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up the receiver in, I'm using electrical tape here. Another thing I like to use is if you're familiar with Captan tape, I like Captan tape because it's, uh, it's transparent. It's translucent anyway, and you can easily see the LEDs a little easier than with the red electrical tape. But here I'm using red electrical tape. That tape provides electrical isolation, of course, but it also provides reinforcement to the wires so that the solder joints don't get pulled on. That's a very good thing. Exactly where all this stuff goes, I just kind of play Tetris and put it together uh, for each individual build. Oftentimes I like to mount the receiver on top of the flight controller. Many people mount the receiver underneath the flight controller, but I find that I usually don't have room for that. Uh, and also it's a little harder to get at the button and see the LEDs in my experience than if you've got it on top. I always twist the wires to try and make sure they are uh, they're, they're, the slack is taken out. 
Uh, here I've got the receiver mounted sideways, which actually is not my preferred way to do it because I like the antennas to come out the back or the front, not out the side where they may be a little more likely to take damage. Basically, you just figure out where it's all going to go. Um, putting a piece of 3M foam tape here that provides a little bit of uh, structural reinforcement. It's going to hold it in place. I also am going to put a zip tie around the receiver. Uh, the foam tape is there not just to hold it in place, but also to give it a little bit of vibration isolation when these two things are touching and pressing up against each other. When I pass the zip tie underneath, I'm going to be really careful not to snag any wires and pull on them. And I'm not going to tighten this down super, super tight. The purpose of this zip tie is just to hold that foam tape in place. The foam tape will keep the receiver from moving. The zip tie will hold the foam place in, in place, foam tape in place. You don't need to crank it down to the point where it bends the board and maybe cracks a, a solder joint on the board. Those are my glasses in my head. Yeah. And now I didn't really like the way that was with the antennas coming out the sides. So I've taken the zip tie off and I'm going to try a different way of doing it. Trying to just get the wire to be nice and neat and out of the way. And this is the kind of picky attention to detail that not everybody will do, but, but I do. Okay, there we go. So far, so good. And now the side plates go on. And did I leave myself enough slack to move the wires out of the way? Yes. Yes, I did. Thank God. Well, put the side plates on. I want to make sure I don't pinch any of these wires by accident as I put the side plate on. Very easy mistake to make. If you make that mistake with the positive ESC wire, you will get a nice surprise when you plug your battery in if you're not using a smoke stopper, which you should be. Now I'm thinking about where the Unify is going to go and whether there's enough room for the Unify to fit in here with the top plate on. And basically the Unify ends up mounted to the top plate. It's not my favorite thing to do because then when you take the top plate off for maintenance, you have to disconnect the Unify. So I really prefer to have all of my electronics attached to the bottom plate so that the top can come off easily for maintenance, but that's just not possible on many of these builds. Here's how I like to mount the video transmitter and the antenna. I like to mount it flat against the top plate so it sticks straight out the back. We talked in the other video about how that, I think that reduces the likelihood of damaging it. And then the other thing I like to do is you'll see where I zip tie it. Uh, I got two zip ties and one's going to go around the threads and one's going to go around. Well, you'll see, you'll see. Uh, and I think this holds it very securely. It, it also reduces the likelihood of the antenna getting broken off at the base. Um, yeah, this is the way I do it. And I very seldom break an antenna. I think it's the best way to do it. And this is the final way I do it. You can see I've got zip ties around the threads and around the base of the pigtail. So there's really nowhere for that to go. I've also got the zip tie holding the Unify against the, the backside of the Unify against the carbon fiber plate. I think that helps with heat dissipation. Uh, and it, the, the zip tie is also reinforcing the UFL connector, the pigtail on the Unify to help prevent it from falling off. You have to be a little careful with that because if you snug that zip tie down too tight, it'll actually pop the UFL connector off. Um, and depending on how you route that UFL connector, it can get pulled down and touch some of the electronics on the board. So you have to be a little careful about that. You might want to coat your Unify in some kind of like, you know, liquid electrical tape, but in this case, the exact way I've got it works out okay. And that's going to bring us to the end of this build. Uh, there's a few steps left. The very basic sort of buttoning up of the of the frame and installing the camera. But that's just putting screws in. There's nothing really excited or exciting or innovative about that. Here's a photo of the finished build for you. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. You leave any questions down in the comments. And as always, happy flying.